Good evening and welcome. You're watching the CNC3 7 p.m. news. I am Bavita Kupolchan. Let's tell you what's making the news tonight. An ex-lover murders a married couple in bed. With crime in the capital city escalating, businesses are closing down. One day after government announces intention to retrench over 200 WASA managers, scores of workers protest. All engagements with the Prime Minister cancelled for now as Dr. Keith Rowley contracts COVID-19 again. Good evening, I'm Ryan Beichu. Here's what's coming up in sport. TNT swimmer Dylan Carter advances to the final of the men's 50-meter butterfly as Team TTO opens its Commonwealth campaign. After a mostly sunny day, some wet weather is on the horizon for the long weekend. Join me, Kaleen Hussain, for the details in tonight's weather forecast. Our top story tonight, tragedy on the North Coast. A love triangle ends in a double murder. A woman's younger lover entered her home at Las Cuevas and killed her and her husband. Tonight, a search is on for the man after he fled into the forest. Neil Romain and Annalisa Paul have the details. <laughs> Friends and family, unable to contain their grief as they saw the bodies removed from the home. 41-year-old Shireen Valdez was warned by her lover that she only had four days to live. On Monday, he kicked in her front door and issued the threat, revealing he had emptied his bank account and was prepared to die. Around 7.30 a.m. today, Valdez and her husband, 40-year-old Hollis Valdez, were both shot dead at their home at Rincon Road. The mother of one was allegedly scared to report the incident because her lover was friendly with the local law enforcement. Relatives of the couple reveal they have been having problems for some time, and it was only about six weeks ago that they decided to take some time apart. During this period, it was claimed that Shireen had begun openly seeing the man who would eventually kill her. Hollis's father told the media he knew the suspect from the area, and he was aware of the problems in his son's relationship, but they were trying to work it out. Yes, yeah, a loving relationship, both of them. Both of them were living nice. We, me and my wife used to come here and talk with them, both of them, and after you just leave and go... Did you know why they virtually separated? No, well, true what's going on. What's going on? He left and come by us, and, and that's it. Angry residents condemned the police for what they called a slow response in looking for the suspect. Seven hours now, these two people have been murdered. Murdered. A, triple, a double murder, right? So, what's going on with the police? What's going on with the army? What taxpayers pay their money for? So, we have no protection in our country. What's going on? What that pay pay the money for? Both victims were lifeguards. They leave behind a 14-year-old daughter. Annalisa Paul, CNC3 News. Intimate partner violence statistics in the Caribbean are higher than the global average. This was revealed by Dr. Halima Deschong, senior lecturer of the Institute for Gender and Development Studies at the UE Cable of Barbados. Speaking at a webinar today, Dr. Deschong said, Data shows that in some countries like Trinidad and Tobago, Guyana, Suriname and Barbados, intimate partner violence remains worrisome. In TNT, the average is 44%, Jamaica 39%, Guyana 55% and in Suriname 48%. In places hit by natural disasters, Dr. Deschong said there has been an increase in violence, particularly against women. Studies showed that men often justify violence by saying women are disobedient. Also in the Caribbean, women and men rationalize love and violence as compatible. She also revealed that the escalation of violence during COVID-19 was over 100% in TNT. Another daylight shooting in Port of Spain has left one man dead and three others injured. The increasing gang activity in the capital city has left many business owners now contemplating whether to close up shop. Downtown Owners and Merchants Association President Gregory Abood said it is time for action. Otto Carrington tells us more in this report. 
more bloodshed in the capital city as one man who is yet to be identified was killed while three others are wounded. The incident occurred just after three on Friday evening at the corner of Queen and George Streets in Port of Spain. The issue of gang violence has been amplified with murders no longer occurring under the cover of darkness. With safety concerns now heavy on their minds, many business owners are closing their doors. Speaking to CNC3 News, Downtown Owners and Merchants Association President Greg Gerbud says despite many business owners leaving, some like himself are prepared to fight. I don't know if they expect that we will abandon Port of Spain. There are some who are talking about it. But we are not abandoning Port of Spain and as long as I am here, we intend to stay and resolve this issue. He says many buildings are also up for sale. The truth is that that has already started. And in reality, probably there is no business other than maybe one or two major business businesses in Port of Spain that do not have multiple branches outside of Port of Spain. And I don't want to tell you, but within mere walking distance of where we are standing, many of these buildings are for sale. The shooting incident caused a traffic nightmare in the capital city as the scene was cordoned off by the police. According to reports, the three other suspects were treated for gunshot wounds and will be warded. One of the injured men ran from the scene and collapsed on Henry Street. Police officers are working on several leads. Abood says it is time for a real conversation about the key issues affecting Port of Spain. The mayor of Port of Spain is concentrating on meat and potatoes at a time when we need to organize our bread and butter. Don't come and talk to us about all sorts of fancy dishes and fancy sauces. And particularly, don't come and talk to us about wrecking. Two weeks ago, a water vendor was shot dead along South Key just before midday. Otto Carrington, CNC3 News. Whilst the workers are demanding that the government debunk what they are calling a fictitious cabinet report, which they believe is only geared to sabotage their reputation. The workers held a protest at the utilities headquarters a day after Minister Marvin Gonzalez announced that 213 managers will be terminated. This is just phase one of the government's restructuring plan. However, the workers say the minister is making decisions based on false information in the cabinet report on the company. They say today is a demonstration of the disapproval and discontent. Chairman of the Public Services Association's WASA section, Mark Saunders, says there aren't even 213 managers to fire. WASA doesn't even have 400 managers. We would have presently operating possibly 70 or less managers in this organization with up to 5,000 workers. So I, we, we do believe that a big part of the plan of the minister was to sabotage the reputation of the WASA workers in a similar vein to those of Petrochin. But Minister Marvin Gonzalez is questioning why these concerns are now being raised when the report was laid in Parliament in 2020. Gonzalez said he has had numerous discussions with the union since then, and at once did they say this. However, the minister said he's not surprised by the request to shelve the report because that will prop up the status quo. All still to come in the news. Slow pace of payment from the state creating cash flow problems for contractors. They say the construction industry is crippling. After a two-year hiatus due to COVID-19 restrictions, curtains raised on the Emancipation Village. We'll bring you the highlights. Welcome back. Prime Minister Dr. Keith Raleigh is spending the Emancipation holiday weekend in isolation after testing positive for COVID-19 for a second time. Now, Dr. Raleigh has contracted the COVID-19 uh, disease. In a statement this morning, the office of the Prime Minister confirmed that Dr. Raleigh, who is fully vaccinated, is experiencing very mild symptoms. He will remain in isolation. Therefore, all of his upcoming engagements have been cancelled, with the exception of an emancipation function at the Diplomatic Centre, carded for today, which will now be hosted by members of the Cabinet. His last public event was on Wednesday during a TTPS movie premiere to commemorate the 1990 attempted coup. Among those in attendance were National Security Minister Fitzgerald Hines and President Paula May Weeks. Dr. Raleigh first tested positive for COVID-19 in April of last year. 
The Construction Management Institute of Trinidad and Tobago says the industry is being crippled by the slow pace of payments from the state. The institute held a symposium today to discuss the state of the construction industry. President Rakesh Ramnath said it is a challenging time for contractors. He said small and medium contractors are suffering the most. At this time, there are a number of small and medium-sized contractors who are actually selling off equipment and some of their assets in order to pay off their debts. And this is a real situation where um, they no longer have the staffing that they would have had before. Um, this cash flow situation has certainly crippled these companies. Ramnath said bigger companies may be able to sustain themselves for a little bit longer. Another board member, Derek Alfred, said legislation is needed to help remedy this problem. For years I've been, I've been advocating that the solution is prompt payment legislation. You know, it's, it's what is required in order to ensure that our industry can grow. You know, the government benefits from it. If they were to do prompt payment legislation, the industry would benefit from it. The supply chain would benefit from it. Prompt payment legislation will probably be even bigger than the procurement legislation. Outreach Sadi has written to Finance Minister Calm Imbert about the legislation and is hoping to see it in this year's budget. Well, following the rescue of several elderly people from a home on Strawberry Local Road, Health Secretary Dr. Faith B. Israel says the Health Ministry and the THA will now be moving to enforce the Private Hospital Act and ensure that all homes for the aged in Trinidad and Tobago are licensed. It is one of the legislation that has been on the, on the books and we have not really used it before. Uh, the Ministry of Health and therefore the Tobago House of Assembly agreed that we would actually start that process of ensuring that all of our homes in Tobago and in Trinidad are actually licensed. And that includes going to each of the homes and doing inspections and so forth. While she could not say much about the home on Strobe, she says a list of registered homes should be ready by the end of this year. Dr. B. Israel was speaking at the launch of the Voluntary Non-Remunerated Blood Donation System in Tobago, a move the Tobago Regional Health Authority is eager about. The aim of this is to try to encourage us to transition to the new way of donating blood, transition away from the traditional CHIT system, so that we can have a better stockpile of safer, healthier blood, whereby when anyone needs blood, blood will be available. We are not there yet, but this is the beginning of our transition. Dr. Wheeler says Tobago needs 600 to 700 people to donate blood at least two to three times per year to serve Tobago's population of 60,000. Well, the Ministry of Finance e-tax service is available once again, and Massey Stores shows appreciation to its customers. Peter Christopher tells us more in tonight's Business Watch. The following Business Watch feature is brought to you by Visa, everywhere you want to be. A temporary e-tax login solution is being offered to those seeking to file their taxes. The Inland Revenue Division has advised. The division says this facilitates taxpayers who are unable to log in via the TT Connect portal that remains unavailable. A statement from the Finance Ministry explains taxpayers will be required to enter their TT Connect ID, BIR number and e-tax password to access the logged in services. Once validated, an authorization code will be forwarded to their email address to complete the login process. This e-tax login solution is available at etax.ird.gov.tt. Massey Stores showed its appreciation to customers via its Customer Appreciation Day earlier today. CEO of Massey Stores, Roxanne DeFreitas, spoke to Business Watch at the West Moines branch. Massey Stores is celebrating our 72nd anniversary. Um, our 70th was two years ago when we had COVID. All right, so we're using this time as an opportunity just to say thank you to our dear customers uh, for their support throughout all the, you know, the Massey Stores legacy. 
and um, it's just a, an opportunity to give back, have some fun. Mr. Freitas says this is the first time since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic that all Massey stores are able to celebrate Customer Appreciation Day. Trade Minister Paula Gopi Schoon has presented instruments of appointment to the board of the newly established Trinidad and Tobago Special Economic Zones Authority. Karen Tom Yu Shardine has been named as chairman of the authority. During the presentation ceremony, Minister Gopi Schoon says among the benefits of the special economic zones will be a modern regulatory framework for a dynamic and attractive regime for Trinidad and Tobago to compete effectively with other jurisdictions for investment. Peter Christopher, CNC3 Business Watch. The preceding Business Watch feature was brought to you by Visa. Everywhere you want to be. The Emancipation Village opened today. This also marks the start of Emancipation Celebrations for 2022. The first of its kind in two years because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Minister of Tourism Randall Mitchell was at the location today to officially open this year's celebrations at the Queen's Park Savannah. Here's Otto Carrington with some highlights. My job here is simple. I officially declare the Ledge Yasu Omowali Emancipation Village open 2022. Thank you. After two years of being unable to have the Ledge Yasu Omawali Emancipation Village at the Queen's Park Savannah open to the public, this year's Emancipation Day celebrations is highly anticipated. After two long years, it feels incredibly good to be back out here again, celebrating the Pan-African Festival of Trinidad and Tobago. Although the festival was affected by the pandemic, Executive Chairman of the Emancipation Support Committee, Zakea Uzuma Wadada, said the pandemic did not let them down, but allowed the committee time to build its resilience and funding. This endeavor upon which we embarked after two years, I think it is as we approached and we began, we remembered what it take to do what we have done for mo the most of the last 30 years, I mean, with all that the fact that it has grown over the years, but the tremendous sacrifice that it takes to make this happen with the limited resources that have been made available to us year after year. The minister toured the village where he was serenaded. A concert will be hosted during the village. Otto Carrington, CNC3 News. Something to add to your weekend plans. We'll still to come in the news. Ever wondered what is the most expensive hotel in the world? Well, we have the answer in This Week in Travel. Good Friday evening, everyone. Across Trinidad and Tobago today, we have some dry air across the country, leading to mostly sunny skies. But if you look to our east, a low-level trough is approaching following the passage of a tropical wave today. And that's forecast to bring some showers and isolated thunderstorms, kicking off what is forecast to be a wet start to the weekend. I'll have the details later in the newscast. Welcome back. The cruise industry is going green and the world's most expensive hotel has been revealed. Can you guess where it is and how much it costs? Well, Brent Panero has the details of This Week in Travel. Carnival Corporation and PLC, the world's largest cruise company, has announced it will start testing biofuel aboard one of its AIDA cruise ships, a major step forward in the company's ongoing sustainability efforts. On July 21st, the AIDA Primer became the first larger scale cruise ship to be bunkered with a blend of marine biofuel, which is made from 100% sustainable raw materials such as waste cooking oil and marine gas oil. The AIDA Prima is currently operating seven day voyages from Rotterdam to popular destinations in Western Europe. On board the AIDA Prima is the cruise industry's largest battery storage system with a capacity of 10 megawatt hours. And JetBlue Airways has reached a $3.8 billion deal to buy Spirit Airlines. The deal, which still needs to be approved by U.S. regulators, would create the fifth largest airline in the USA. 
JetBlue executives say that by buying Spirit Airlines, it would fast track its growth by giving it access to more Airbus jetliners and pilots, and help it compete with large carriers like American, Delta, United, and Southwest, which control most of the U.S. market. The New York-based carrier reported the plans to overhaul Spirit's signature yellow planes in keeping with JetBlue's branding. JetBlue currently operates daily flights from JFK to Trinidad. Spirit Airlines once offered non-stop service to Port of Spain out of Fort Lauderdale back in 2008. However, that service was later terminated. And if money is no problem, then listen up. Travelmag.com just released its list of the world's most expensive hotels. And in the number one spot is the North Island Lodge. Located on a private island in the Seychelles, this exclusive property features 11 villas dotted along the island's beaches, along with numerous dining options and a luxurious spa. Guests can enjoy water sports activities, including scuba diving, snorkeling, paddle boarding, and sea kayaking. Interested? Well, get ready to fork out an eye-popping minimum rate of almost 50,000 TT dollars per night based on double occupancy. That food does look fantastic, though. Brent Panero, CNC3 News. Well, Colleen, we may not have the money to fly to the <laughs> most expensive hotel for this long weekend, but I'm hoping that we at least have some good weather, maybe to go to Tobago. I have some bad news for you, Bavita. We do no. expect some rainfall, not only tomorrow, not only Sunday, but also on Monday as well. Wow. So the good news though, cooler temperatures. So let's go take a look at what we expect this weekend. Because we have a tropical wave that moved across Trinidad and Tobago today, and with all the sunshine, you wouldn't really expect a tropical wave was moving across us, right? But we had some dry air that moved across us as well on the southern portion of this wave axis. And that, mean, that meant rather some sunshine for us. We did see some cloudiness develop during the late morning through the afternoon. But looking to our east, we have multiple weather systems that will be affecting us through the next five days, starting with a surface to low level trough right here that will begin to spread across Trinidad and Tobago from around five tomorrow morning and spread throughout the day, bringing cloudiness, showers, and nicely thunderstorms. Then by nightfall, we have a tropical wave, which will be bringing lots of showers and thunderstorms sun, sun, uh, Saturday night into Sunday morning. And that means more rainfall for us but this wave will be bringing in a surge of Saharan dust that trails, and that should dry the atmosphere out across Tobago. So if you're heading there, expect some hazy conditions with variably cloudy skies. But for Trinidad, we have the intertropical convergence zone that will be sticking around all the way into Monday morning, and that means cloudy and wet weather for us. So looking at the forecast for us overnight tonight, uh, we do expect subtle conditions for the most part towards the early morning. That's when we expect to see some showers and even isolated thunderstorms develop, mainly across Tobago and eastern parts of Trinidad, drifting across the island towards, the, towards daybreak. Minimum low temperatures between 23 and 25 degrees. For tomorrow, though, starting off with some showers and isolated thunderstorms in the morning, leading to a variably cloudy day. We will be seeing some isolated uh, pockets of sunshine throughout the day, but don't expect it to remain because we have lots of moisture and instability and that tropical wave moving in. If you are braving the weather conditions to head to the beach this weekend, exercise caution because we have spring tides in effect, higher than usual high tides, lower than, uh, lower than usual low tides, so exercise caution. But in open waters, waves will be up to two meters in sheltered areas below one meter, but occasionally choppy and looking through the next five days we have rain through monday particularly through monday morning then we have that saharan dust surge drying things out from sunday into monday across tobago and then across trinidad on tuesday but then by wednesday another trough moves back in leading to a wet end to next week as well so lots of rainfall in the forecast and unfortunately that means we may need to push some of our outdoor plans indoors so Bavita, what are your outdoor plans this weekend that you may need to push indoors Colleen, let me just say that I'm very disappointed right now because long weekend usually means I get to go to the beach and have some fun. Well, maybe, what is this, there to do maybe this weekend you go inside, you watch some movies, curl up with a good book, enjoy the cool temperatures because the heat will be on once that sunshine comes back. And you know what is the ironic thing? The fact that the sun will come out on Tuesday. Yeah, when the we day, all have to go back out Exactly. To yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right. Hopefully we got some uh, good weather next weekend. Yep, next weekend. Fingers crossed. <laughs> All right, well, still to come in the news. Alto officials warn they're going after unlicensed homes.
The Trinidad and Tobago Scrap Iron Dealers Association says its work to improve the industry is beginning to bear fruit. Earlier this month, the association met with a cabinet subcommittee set up by the Prime Minister to develop a policy for the industry. Dr. Keith Rowley had expressed deep concern over the increasing number of theft of state assets. But the dealers say while they're working with the government, it has started its own work to help alleviate the situation. And whilst we're waiting on them, we said to them that we will go out to try to inform our members what to do and what not to do. And it's working good. We see that a lot of people from, from all over Trinidad is coming and registering with us. The people who do the collecting, they're coming on working with us and registering with us. So it is going good. He says there are some people who want to see the industry shut down. However, Ferguson says he would never allow that to happen under his watch. One human rights activist is tonight calling for the establishment of a national coalition to treat with the criminal justice system. Adiola Young says a lot of meaningful change can happen when stakeholders come together. She was speaking during a dialogue on youth crime and the justice system hosted by the Caribbean Center for Human Rights. She said a coalition can make a big impact. I think a coalition that really is focused towards this type of justice that involves attorneys, that involves persons who work in the system, as well as, you know, sociologists and people, social workers. It takes, you know, a lot of us to come together and see where we meet, where the division is, and also, you know, how can we come together to work on this issue collectively. However, Young said once recommendations are made, there needs to be the political will to take it to the parliament. Welcome back. Nominated U.S. Ambassador to Trinidad and Tobago, Candace Bond is one step closer to becoming the official ambassador. She told the Senate Foreign Relations Committee on Thursday if confirmed she will work to ensure security in the region, give support to victims of human trafficking, and combat climate change. Trinidad and Tobago has been without a substantive U.S. ambassador since January 13th, 2021. Keijan Haynes has more. Good morning to all. This hearing of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee will come to order. We are here to consider important ambassadorial nominees. She's not taking up this office just yet. The U.S. Senate Committee on Foreign Relations is the second step for potential ambassadors. It comes after the nomination, but before the vote. Candace Bond, in her opening remarks, said the values instilled in her by her family and her experiences as a business and community leader have equipped her to advance the common interests of the United States states in Trinidad and Tobago. If confirmed as con an ambassador, I will work to promote accountability and transparency and combat com corruption, which not only helps improve overall climate for foreign direct investment and trade, but also enables inclusive and sustainable economic growth for all citizens. She noted we need to strike the balance between Trinidad as a major partner in the energy industry, but also to reduce climate change impacts and bolster energy security. She said Trinidad and Tobago is well positioned to help speed up the development of clean energy infrastructure and climate adaptation projects. But without referencing the crime situation directly, she said if confirmed, she will be ensuring the safety and security of 13,000 Americans living in Trinidad and Tobago and thousands more who visit every year for business and tourism. Trinidad and Tobago is a regional leader on security and a partner in the fight against transnational organized crime. I look forward to working with the government of Trinidad and Tobago and international partners to help better support vulnerable populations, including victims of human trafficking, as well as Venezuelan migrants and refugees. Bond was asked specifically about this country's close relationship with China as the U.S. and China continue to fight for influence in the region. She'd only say that she would work to keep the U.S. as a preferred trading partner. Now, Democratic Senator for New Jersey Cory Booker sang her praises, saying that an Alaskan sled dog and a worker bee are all jealous of her work ethic. All my Trinidadian friends have told me throughout the years that the best carnival all throughout uh, the Caribbean is in Trinidad. Well, I don't know what kind of celebration they will have in the future, but I know that when this incredible person is confirmed as ambassador, 
we in the Senate should have a carnival to celebrate that good and wise choice. Kijan Haynes, CNC3 News. And he's right, we do have the best carnival. The Tribe Carnival Group recently hosted its Sunset Weekend to announce its Carnival 2023 presentation in a major way. From its street theater along Arapita Avenue last Friday all the way through to its signature street parade on Sunday. We were there and bring you the best moments in the party start. <laughs> It hasn't been easy being an artist for the past three years. Seeing the world we know collapse around us, our industry draws to a halt, it does something to you. You know, the mind of the artist absorbs, but it also amplifies. And as terrifying as our creative process is, it makes us dream, and those dreams lead to reality. As artists, if there's one thing that we know, no night outlasts the sun, and the dreams will always define the future. For the dreamers who give us carnival, it is not just two days of a parade, it's not just wine and jam. Carnival is a deep ancestral calling to us. Yes, it is jobs, it's livelihood, but more than that, it's the entire reason that we've been put here on this tiny little island. You know, our Trinidad and Tobago is disproportionately rich in culture to its tiny size. Our perspective is so beautiful and unique and loud, and it stands and shines on the world stage. We've seen virtual parties, fets, tours and experiences, but while they showed us how important the language of technology is in accenting our culture, it definitely cannot be replaced. Nothing and no one anywhere on any island or in any other carnival can replace what we have. Tonight's show is based on dreams as well. A dream of mine to see our characteristic showmanship evolve and a dream of the tribe group to evolve the Trinidadian entertainment experience. And the last shall be first. And what we mean by that is, this is the last night of three days of event. This is the party start. Try band launch, sunset weekend. Party start. Action! 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 Somebody now, hold on, somebody now. Make them your family. We are the 
have seen or met some members of the Guardian Media Limited newsroom at events you attended today. Guardian Media's Colleen Hussein, Carissa Lee and Joel Julian all made special guest appearances at different events. Colleen Hussein spoke with children at a vacation Bible school at the Reform Open Bible Church today. He told them to follow their dreams and answered questions about his profession. Well, Carissa Lee was a pronouncer at Rand's Bright Beginners Preschool Spelling Bee Competition. And Joel Juliet, well, he spoke with students enrolled in the vacation revision program. His message to the students who need that extra boost before entering secondary school was to focus on themselves and do the best they can. Because in my eyes, he was like this perfect child. I used to compare myself to him all the time. And the thing about comparison is that comparison teaches your joy. It steals your joy, you know. If it is you, you com constantly compare yourself to people, you will not understand your true worth. Some powerful advi advice there. Joel was a guest speaker at the Minister of Education Vacation Revision Programs. Turn up, don't give up caravan. Well, it's time to recap our headlines. An ex-lover murders a married couple in bed. With crime in the capital city escalating, businesses are closing down. Well, that brings us to the end of tonight's newscast. On behalf of the entire team, I am Bavita Kopolchan. Thank you so much for watching. Have a good night and a wonderful weekend ahead.